Hi everyone. Uh, this is Mohammed. Uh, my name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm one of the. I'm working as a senior clinical teaching fellow in Oxford University Hospital. Uh, uh, my pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, and today uh, I'm going to 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 speak with you about acute chest pain presentation. Uh, so uh, this uh, lecture will be a, a 60 minute lecture and there will be a 15 minutes case-based interactive discussion. And after the 15 minutes, uh, there will be uh, 10 minutes for questions at the end. So our objectives today, uh, the first thing we'll start with how to interpret an ECG. So we'll, well, I'll take you uh, briefly about how to read the ECG or how to interpret an ECG. And then we'll speak about how to interpret a chest X-ray. Uh, then we'll speak about common chest pain ED presentation. And then we'll speak about easily missed ED presentation, a chest pain emergency department presentation. And at the end of lecture, uh, there will be a 10 minutes for uh, questions and then a conclusion. Uh, as I told you this, I I'll try to make it uh, as an interactive discussion as much as we can. So uh, uh, your interactivity will be highly appreciated. But before we start, uh, why we are speaking about chest pain? What is the importance of the chest pain? Okay, so uh, uh, chest pain. So someone on the chat has said it's, it's a life or death situation. It's Brilliant. a common presentation in ED. Brilliant. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's a schist pain is is a, a very common ED presentation. Uh, you will find it in a in a pediatric. Uh, so if you're working in a pediatric, okay, brilliant. So if you're working in a pediatric emergency department, you will find a schist pain in a, in a teenagers and you know middle age and elderly as well. It could be life threatening at some presentation, which is absolutely right. Uh, in the UK, there is a seven hundred thousand a year. Uh, chest pain presentation to the emergency department. And from those 700,000, uh, nearly 25% requires hospital admission. So it's a bit important and it's a bit tricky uh, to, you know, to have a good view regarding the chest pain. Uh, first thing we are going to speak about is how to interpret an ECG. So anyone have any idea about how to in a basic how to read or how to interpret an ECG, please. All right, so uh, to read an ECG, you have to go through 10 uh, things you, you have to mention while, while interpreting an ECG. Uh, first of all, I will take you through the names of uh, the waves in the ECG. So this is a, a B wave, brilliant. So I can see a, a rhythm rate B wave, QRS complex ST, brilliant, and uh, named it speed and named it rate and rhythm. Excellent. So uh, yes, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, some of the most important things. Um, again, uh, let's name some waves first, and then we'll take you how to interpret and then rate axis. Excellent. So first thing is a B wave. So this, this considers so B, Q, R, S, T, this complex, or this is on the screen, is a heartbeat translated into the paper by this picture. So the first thing here is a B wave here. This is a B wave. And then this is a QRS complex. And this is a ST segment. And this is a T wave. OK. So to comment about ECG, you have to check the rate first, as you mentioned. And do, do we have any idea how to calculate the heart rate? Okay, so the heart rate, uh, you calculate the heart rate if it is regular or not. Excellent, it depends on whether regular or rhythm. So either regular or irregular, yes, excellent. This is, that's, that's really brilliant. Uh, if it is regular, so you calculate, you can count the large boxes and then divide it between PRS complex, excellent. So this, if it is regular, so you calculate, you count how many number of large boxes between two R waves and then divide it 300 by this number. So let's go for this. So this is how to calculate the regular heart rate. You calculate the number of large boxes between two R waves and then divide it by, so 300 by the number of the large box between two R waves, as you, as you mentioned. 
Okay. And if it is irregular, do we have any idea how to count it if it is irregular? Okay, so if it is irregular heart rate, if the heart rate in the ECG is irregular, so you simply count a number of uh, complexes in, in, in 60, sorry, sorry, in 10 seconds, in other words, in 30 large square extent, which equals to 10 seconds. Excellent. So yeah, count number in, 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 in complex in 30 large squares, then multiply by 10. That's, that's absolutely right. Okay, so the first thing you mentioned is a, is a heart rate. Then after checking the heart rate, you are checking the rhythm. The rhythm would be either you have to, to comment whether it is regular or it is irregular. And after checking the rhythm, you are going to check the axis. Either it is a right axis or, the, or a left axis. And, and do we have any idea how to check that? Excellent, so you, you are checking in a lead one and lead two, brilliant. So lead one and three, yes. So, you know, ideally we should checking in lead one and lead two, but we can check in one lead and, and lead one and lead three as well. So if the complex, which is a QR is, is positive in lead one and lead two, this means it's a normal axis. If it is positive in lead one and negative in lead two, this means it's an, a left axis deviation. If it is positive in lead two and negative in lead one, this means a right axis deviation. Okay, brilliant. So we comment about the rate, we comment about the rhythm, and then we comment about uh, the axis. So after checking the axis, we are going to the waves. So first thing is a B wave. So B wave represents the atrial contractility, and what is the clinical significance of the B wave? why we are concerned about B wave in the ECG, why we are reading it on the ECG. You know what, you know, the, um, for example, is it, you know, is there any clinical significance for it? Exactly, yes. So, so, so the B wave will be absent, yes. It's a, basically it, should, it is a sinus rhythm, is a, is, is a heart is facing from the sinus, from the normal sinus, which is each B wave followed by QRS complex. Brilliant. And, and, to check for an atrial fibrillation as well, because it would be absent in atrial fibrillation. Brilliant. Okay, P pulmonal, if it is peaked, yes, excellent. Then after checking B wave, we are going to check the PR interval. So the PR interval is from the, from the start of the P wave till from the start of P wave here, till the start of QRS complex. Okay, and what is the clinical significance for that? Brilliant, so we're checking for a, for a heart block. Brilliant, that's, yes. WBW, excellent. So what is what is the problem in the WBW syndrome, Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome? What would be happening in, in a PR interval? Short PR interval, brilliant. So yes, so PR interval is, uh, it's usually it's a transmission of, you know, the electricity is going from the atria to the ventricles. If it is going very fast, this means a very short uh, BR interval, exactly as you answer your questions, which is a WBW syndrome, and it will, will be prolonged in first degree heart block. So we comment about B, then PR interval, then going for a QRS complex. So QRS complex, which represent a ventricular contractility, and what is the clinical significance for that? So how, you know, how normally should be this, the width of this QRS complex? Brilliant, so less than 120 milliseconds, which means three small squares, okay? So if it is longer than this, this means a bundle branch block, brilliant. Then we'll go for a ST segment. So yes, wide for bundle branch block, brilliant. Either right or left bundle branch block, thank you. Uh, so uh, after that, we'll go for a ST segment. So ST segment is a most important segment in the ECG uh, because it's elevation or depression indicate a significant cardiac ischemia is going on there. Uh, T wave, and this is the end of, yes, exactly. So ST basically include the MI and some electrolyte imbalance, brilliant. Then T wave, which is the end of the, of the ECG, okay. So this is that elevation brilliant in MI or pericarditis, brilliant. Thank you, and hyperkalemia. 
Okay, hyperkalemia usually uh, causing T wave, tall peaked T wave, and some uh, QRS complex will be wide QRS complex, and and might cause some bradycardia and a heart block as well. Thank you. Okay, and this is how to calculate. So uh, yeah, so we mentioned uh, how to read the ECG, how to interpret an ECG. So we have to check the rate, rhythm, axis then go for a P wave, BR interval, QRS complex, ST segment, T wave, and QT segment as well. Okay, so the next thing is how to interpret an HST X-ray. So first thing is uh, to confirm your patient name and details. So patient name, date of birth, and hospital number. This is the first thing you do, and make sure this is the X-ray in the same date and time you ordered it, okay? And after that, brilliant. So we are going in an organized way. Brilliant. So A, B, or B, E, or, or anthroposterior. Okay. Check lung vascularity, heart size, heart lung. Okay. So yes. So as, as anything in the emergency department, we are going through uh, A, B, C, D approach. In the X-ray, we are going through A, B, C, D approach as well. Yes. This all answers is right. Yes. So A stands for airway. So airway is a trachea. So we're looking for trachea. Make sure trachea is centralized and right and left main bronchus and carina. Brilliant, this is for A. Then go for B, which is breathing and bones. So B for breathing, we are looking for the lungs, have a good look on the lungs, compare the right and left side, check for bronchovascular marking and check for any infiltration or any consolidation or a, or a collapse in the lung. So, and usually compare the right and the left. And then in the B, we're still in the B, check for the bones, have a look on the ribs, look for infractures, and have a look on the clavicle, shoulders, and spine as well. So we mentioned A for airway, which is trachea, then B, breathing and bone. C, looking for a cardiac shadow. So cardiac shadows here in the center of the, of the X-ray, ideally the, this, Ideally, the cardiac shadow, so the cardiac size should be less than 50% of total diameter of the anterior chest wall. So if we calculate from here till here, how many centimeters, and calculate from here to here, okay? So the first line here should be less than 50% of the total chest diameter. Uh, and again, look, in the, look at the cardiac borders, make sure the cardiac borders are, are clear because it might be not clear in some infection like a pneumonia or infiltration in the right or on the left side of the lung. So then look for diaphragm and look for costophrenic angles and look below diaphragm to make sure there is no air under diaphragm. Anything else or everything else, which means you are looking for endotracheal tube, central lines, pacemakers, nasogastric tube, and have a look on a subcutaneous emphysema, sorry, uh, on a soft tissue, looking for a subcutaneous emphysema in the, in the chest X-ray. Okay. So this is how, this is an ABCD approach, A, B, C, D, E approach, how to read, how to, how to interpret chest X-ray. Okay, going now to our cases. So the first one, so this case, uh, I saw this patient three weeks ago. He's a young male who came to the emergency department. He's 25 years old male coming into the emergency department with a one day history of chest pain with a normal vital signs. So this patient arrived to you in the emergency department, how, how you will approach this patient. Yes, A, B, C, D, okay. So it's taking a history, vital signs, history, brilliant. Examination, brilliant. History, physical exam. I need more details, brilliant. Vital signs, brilliant. So yes, so uh, physical examination, exclude trauma and muscular strain, ECG, okay, vital signs lab, brilliant. So all of these answers is right, but we need to organize it and reshape it to make sure uh, we are going a systemic approach. So this patient is stable. So he's 25, fit and healthy, coming with a chest pain with normal vital signs. So first thing, as long as your patient is stable, then the first thing we will do is taking more history, detailed history. So what is the history you need to, you need to know more about this chest pain? Brilliant, so Socrates, yes. So we need to know 
we need we know can can you mention more about socrates yes said Ponset, yes excellent character radiation association brilliant that's really brilliant answers thanks so much so if we go to socrates approach so this site increasing and relieving just brilliant thank you so yes so we are going for uh when the pain started so where where is the pain so the first thing is where is the pain what the patient was doing when this pain started so this patient uh the pain started one day history and the pain is central chest pain radiating to the back positional radiate positional uh, related uh, um, the pain looks like a, a sharp pain in the center of the chest so it was radiating to the back and there's no osseous symptoms and apart from he got some flow symptoms in the last one week uh, how long they have this this pain so they had it for one day and E exacerbating and relieving factors. So the pain uh, relieved when in, in a sitting position while the patient is sitting position. And the last thing is the severity of the pain. So pain score was around six to 10, uh, six out of 10. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so you took a history from the patient. Brilliant, so I can see answers of pericarditis, brilliant. So this is ECG. So what do you think about this ECG? Generalized ST elevation, brilliant, thank you. Diffuse ST elevation, thank you. PR depression, excellent. Diffuse ST elevation, yes. So yes, all of these are the right answers. Thanks so much. So this patient, it's, it's a classic picture of pericarditis. There's a PR depression, yes. So you can see a widespread ST elevation in the whole ECG lead and some PR depression as well. Yes, so, uh, so you ask, someone ask for some blood. So his vital signs is okay. Uh, you take a history. You uh, you did an ECG and someone asked for bloods. Is there anything specific you need to check in his bloods? Or what blood test you need to order for him? ESR, CRB, excellent, thank you. So you need inflammatory markers. CRB, yes, okay, CBC, brilliant. So we need a blood count, we need a kidney function, and we need a cardiac enzymes, excellent. So we need a, a basics of you know full blood count, we need a kidney function, we need inflammatory markers, and we need a troponin or a cardiac enzymes. So the next question is what, so his blood comes back as normal. So the next question is what is the disposition for this patient? What you are going to do for him? Are you going to admit him or are you going to send him home? Okay, so I can see it's charged on anti-inflammatory, admit, send him home. Brilliant. So yes, so uh, there are criteria. So basically a pericarditis in a young, uh, fit and well, healthy patient doesn't require admission. Uh, usually, yes, that's right. Non-steroidal anti-charge. Yes, home or non-steroidal, thank you. So usually those patients uh, uh, will be to charge at home safely with uh, non-steroidal like aspirin or ibuprofen, but there is some criteria for admission. What is the criteria for admission in such patient? When to say this patient needs admission? There are usually, there are four criteria for that. Okay, other comorbidities, okay, could be, yeah. Fever more than 38, excellent. This is the first, first criteria, which is the patient is febrile more than 38 temperature, yes. Elderly comorbidity, yeah, could be. Increase the RBNC and ESR, yes. In high inflammatory markers, there is another indication for admission, yes. So the first one is a fever or temperature more than 38. And the second indication is in raised inflammatory markers. The third one is uh, if the patient is, okay, so he, he would be having pressure up anyway. Uh, yeah, so uh, and the third one is if the patient has got um, pericardial, moderate, you know, pericardial effusion or uh, pericardial effusion or tamponade. And the last one is if the patient is immunocompromised or uh, IV drug user, because those patients will be uh, having uh, myocarditis very easily, a fatal myocarditis easily. Okay, so this is the first case. Going to the next one, which is 75 years old male coming to the emergency department with a chest pain two days history. What will be your approach? Okay, ECG. Yeah, so his ECG is a ABCD approach. Okay, I agree. So uh, this patient is stable. So this patient has vital signs. Uh, ABCD approach, excellent. ABC vital signs. Yes, vital signs has. Febrile 39, systolic blood pressure of 110, 
uh, uh, respiratory rate of 32 and his temperature, sorry, and his saturation was 94% on two liters oxygen. So what you are going to do next for him? Yeah, it looks like pneumonia. So yeah, so you order an X-ray. Okay, chest X-ray, you need an chest X-ray. Brilliant, thank you. That is his chest X-ray. So this patient got a right lower loop and pneumonia. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, like, in, in a septic picture. Okay, brilliant. So the next step is, so you, you took a history from the patient. So as we mentioned, as long as your patient is stable enough to take a history, you have to take a history. Uh, this history should be including a past medical history if, his, if he has any other comorbidities. Uh, after taking a history or ideally while you are taking a history, uh, the nurse will be helping you with doing some bloods and an ECG if needed and you can order an chest X-ray as well and, and connect him to a monitor to check for his vital signs. After having a full history and the vital signs and an ECG and the bloods, you will have a clear picture of what is the next step. So what is the next step for him? So you have sent for him some bloods and his white blood cells came back as high. Brilliant, so I can see a curb 65. Can someone mention to me please what curb 65 means? So urea, Respiratory rate, his age is more than 65. So a uh, CURB-65 is a, is a scoring system to detect or uh, predict uh, the mortality uh, of the confusion. Brilliant, thank you. So yeah, so to detect the, to predict the mortality of the community acquired pneumonia. Uh, so this patient, he is 75. This, he got one score here. Okay, his systolic blood pressure is, is 90. Sorry, his systolic blood pressure was 110. So this means he got zero here. His respiratory rate was 32. This means he got one here and his urea is 14. And he's not confused. So he's got, uh, he has got a three out of five score. This means he got a severe pneumonia. He requires admission with four IV antibiotics according to hospital policy. And, and, and this patient, uh, if you remember, I told you in the history, he's requiring oxygen. So if he's requiring oxygen, regardless of the score, he will be in need admission to the hospital as long as he requires oxygen. Okay, so going to the third one. So a 65 years old male coming with a central left-sided chest pain, and this pain started two hours history. What will be your approach for this patient? ABCD approach, okay, thank you. ABC vital signs, thank you. ECG, thank you. ABCD history, history, brilliant. Thanks so much, vitals, ABCD approach. Yes, brilliant. Yes, thank you. More history, yes, so is, so yeah. So this patient, he was stable, apart from he was pale, some sort of pale and clammy when he came. So the vein is in the left side of the chest, going to the left shoulder, going to the left arm, and going to the left side of the neck as well. And it started two hours uh, associated with a sweat. He was sweaty and had feeling of, yes, suspect MI. So, yes. Okay. So, uh, yes, acute coronary syndrome. Yes, thank you. Cardiac enzymes. Thank you so much. So, yes. So, as long as your patient is stable, MI angina, thank you. So, as long as your patient is stable, then you will have some time to take a history. And while taking history, as I mentioned, you can ask the nurses to get, you know, some IV line, send the bloods, yes, vital signs, check his vitals and, and do an ECG for him. Uh, ABCD approach, that's absolutely uh, right in, in, uh, in uh, a sick patient or unstable patient. Yes, so his vital signs was okay. His blood pressure is 120 systolic. His uh, heart rate was around 90. Someone asked for an uh, ECG and that is his ECG. What do you think about his ECG? Brilliant. ST elevation, yes. Where is the ST elevation? So we have anterior MI, excellent. Thank you. ST elevation, yes. Anterior MI. Can we see anything in the lateral leads? Yes. So he got anterior, anter brilliant. Yes, he got an anterolateral uh, ST elevation MI. Okay, so uh, do you know how to uh, read, repeat an ECG? Okay, yes. Right ECG, okay. Okay, so uh, to say anterior or lateral or inferior MI, do we have any idea? what, you know, what leads we have to, you know, which lead and which uh, anterior lateral and inferior. Okay, so I'll show it to you. Yes, so uh, this is lead one and two or three. 
So lead two and three and EV, AVF is inferior. Yes, excellent, thank you. And lead one, AVL and V5 and six, this will be a lateral and V1, 2, 3, and V4 is anthroceptal. So our patient here, our patient here, he got elevation V1, V2, V3. Uh, we can say here slightly here in V4. And in the same time, he got in a lead one and AVL. And you can see slight elevation here, very minimal elevation. So he got ST elevation, anterolateral ST elevation, myocardial infarction. And he got some reciprocal changes in the inferior leads. So if you can see the inferior leads here, there's some ST depression and inverted T as well. Okay, so uh, so 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 what is our diagnosis now? Okay, so yes, yeah, so so the treatment he needs a BCI. So uh, a diagnosis is acute MI. Okay, so a diagnosis is ST elevation, anterolateral ST elevation MI. Yes, brilliant. And how to diagnose ST elevation MI? What is the criteria for that? Okay, so yes, so there, there is three criteria to diagnose uh, ST elevation MI. So, yeah, so the one millimeter and two millimeter is indication for a BCI, but to diagnose the ST elevation is, yes, symptoms, yes, excellent. Symptoms, which is a cardiac sounding chest pain. This is criteria number one. Cardiac enzyme, if raised, so uh, cardiac enzymes, yes. And, and, and ECG, ST elevation in the ECG, yes, brilliant. So two of this criteria means ST elevation MI. And if we got this diagnosis, as you mentioned before in your answers, we need to activate uh, so the, the, the BCI or a cat lab. So ideally, uh, any patient coming to the ED with the chest pain should have an ECG within 10 minutes and, and should be having or should be activating cat lab within how many minutes? Any clue, any idea? 90 minutes, excellent. Yes, so door to ECG is 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes, and door to balloon is less than 90 minutes. And if you don't have a BCI or percutaneous, uh, percutaneous coronary uh, intervention in your facility, what is the other option for you? Thrombolysis, excellent. That's really brilliant, thanks so much. So, and while, so you, uh, for, for this patient with this presentation, you have to call uh, the cardiology registrar early, as soon as you can. And if you have a, a cat lab in your facility, then you should activate the cat lab as soon as you can, uh, as early as possible. Um, and then while the patient is waiting in your department, in the emergency department, what you are going to do for him. So this patient will need or requires a resus bed. So you, you need to put him in a resus bed, in a resus monitor bed. Uh, load him with aspirin, uh, antiplatelets, as long as there's no contraindication. Give him a good painkillers, usually morphine, uh, five milligram as an IV, and, and give him antiemetic as well. And, and after, after that, keep him nitrate, yes, we have to start a GTN infusion for him, as long as there's no contraindications. And keep him his oxygen saturation around uh, 94. Thank you. So going to the next one, uh, this young lady, six years old lady, presented with, sorry, six years old lady coming with a central left, left side chest pain, and this pain started this morning. What, what would be your approach? What we are going to do for her while she's in your department? History, ABC, yes, excellent, thank you. ABC, vital signs, history, brilliant, thank you. History and physical exam, yes. History, physical exam, ECG, thank you, ECG, yes. Yes, so uh, the key point, uh, yes, the key point is history taking. Okay, so history, as long as your patient is stable and you have time to take history, then take a history. And while doing the history, ask someone, ask one of the nurses to help you to connect the patient to a monitor, check his vital signs, and put a line in his arm and do some bloods. Okay, and this lady, this patient started this. This pain started since morning, and and no other symptoms and normal vital signs. So you, someone asked for an ECG, and that's her ECG. What do you think about this ECG? ST depression. Thank you. So where is the ST depression? Brilliant. Thank you. ST depression schema anterolateral. Thanks so much. Yes, yes. So what is our diagnosis now? 
non-stimmy, yes. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so how to differentiate if it is unstable or non stemi So troponin, yes, excellent. Thanks so much. So the heart enzymes will yes, thank you. So the heart enzymes will be raised in non stemi So this lady got a troponin of uh, um, 1000, which was high, and, and she got a non ST elevation in my. Uh, and how to, you know, how to treat such patient? Yes, Timmy score, brilliant. Yes, PCI, yes. So she, she will not need, so she will need a BCI anticoagulant, yes. So we'll start the same treatment. So she will need, uh, she will need to be kept in a monitor bed, uh, loaded with aspirin and antiplatelets, pain control like morphine, IV morphine and, and antiemetic as well. Involve a cardi cardiology team early. Uh, this patient will need a PCI at some point and she would be need to be kept in the hospital uh, with this diagnosis, beta blockers, yes. Yes, so antiplatelets, beta blockers, statin, yes. Okay, so uh, this is a classification of acute coronary syndrome. So if patient is coming to you with a chest pain, as we mentioned, either you should have an ECG within 10 minutes. If the chest pain is cardiac sound chest pain, then you did an ECG within 10 minutes, you find the ST elevation in the ECG, this means this patient got ST elevation MI, and if your patient got ST elevation MI, you, he will need a PCI. So the next step here is urgent cardiology referral and activate a CAT lab if you have one in your facility. Suspect acute coronary syndrome, and she, he got some ST segment, ST T wave changes, if he's positive troponin, this means he got non stemi If negative troponin, this means he got an unstable angina. And this patient, so non stemi will be need to be admitted in the hospital under cardiology team. And unstable angina, either you should be kept in a hospital under a medical or a cardiology, depending on the, the hospital policy. So the next one is a young lady, 50 years old lady, coming with right sided pleuritic chest pain one day history. So ABCD approach, history taking. Yes, so the, yes, history and physical examination, brilliant, vital signs. So yes, so the, the history was chest x-ray, thank you, sputum culture, thank you. All right, so the pain was on the right side of the chest and it started this morning and uh, this pain is getting worse if she's taking a deep breath, full deep breath and uh, no other symptoms apart from feeling some shortness of breath. Uh, no other symptoms whatsoever. And she had a history of D, uh, DVT two years ago and she stopped her anticoagulant for six months ago for some reason. So what we are concerning about. So he, she got a normal vital sign. So her pulse was around, she's sinus tech around 110. Yes, she got a PE. Yes, she had a, she had a diagnosis of PE and she stopped her anticoagulant uh, uh, six months ago by herself. All right, so how to diagnose a PE? Or is there any specific CT angiograph? Brilliant. Yes, Wells score, yes, brilliant. Double skin D-dimer, CT angio, yes, CTPA, CT pulmonary angiogram. Thanks so much, yes. So the, yes, the investigation of choice is a CT, CT angio, CT pulmonary uh, angiogram. Uh, is there any specific ECG changes or chest X-ray finding in a PE? Yes, so yeah, the ECG uh, would be, uh, most commonly will be normal. Sometimes, most of the time, will be sinus tachy as well. Sinus tachy, yes, excellent. This is the most common presentation. It's a sinus tachy cardia, S1, T3, Q3, usually less than 15%. Right axis deviation, absolutely right. Yes, and, and the CT uh, pulmonary angio, angio is, a, is an investigation of choice for such patient. So the next step is, are what the next, what the next step for her? Are you going to admit or to charge that patient? Okay, so she, she got a normal vital signs. Here's blood pressure 120 over 80. Pulse, as you can see, around 90. Saturation is around 96 to 98 on room air. Admit, okay, okay. And she got a normal X-ray. Okay, so it, it, it depends on the, it depends on the hospital policy. Uh, where, where, where here, where, where I'm working is a stable ambulatory patient can be safely to charge for uh, with you know to follow up in 24 hours in ambulatory clinic after giving a low molecular weight heparin this is the first option yes so uh, yes this is what we are doing uh, at the moment so we are giving a therapeutic low molecular weight heparin as long as the patient is stable doesn't require oxygen 
and we are not suspecting any other diagnosis or any other problem. So we're sending the patient home with a shot of low molecular weight heparin to come back tomorrow morning in the ambulatory clinic. If your patient is unstable or requiring oxygen, what this means? So the patient coming with this picture, right-sided pleuritic chest pain, and, and the patient is, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, for sure, she will need, he will need admission. So, but this means a massive BE. Okay, if you know thrombolysis, yes, massive BE, brilliant, thank you, yes. So this means he got a massive BE. Brilliant, thanks so much, yes. So if your patient got, uh, if you suspect about massive BE, you have to call, uh, 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 you know, the ITU team, ICU or ITU team uh, as early as you can. And, and do not take unstable patient to the, to the CT. So uh, 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 it's a bit uh, tricky. So don't take unstable patient to the CT. Uh, and he will need to be kept in a hospital and he will need a hospital admission. Brilliant. Okay, going to the next one. Okay, so this young chap was playing football yesterday. I've seen this guy a year ago. Uh, he was playing football last night and um, and he coming with the right side chest pain and shortness of breath. What will be your approach? And from that, so uh, yes, from the history, you find that he got, uh, he fell many times. He fell down on his right side of the chest and he had a knee. Yes, there is a trauma. Excellent. Thank you. He got a, he got a knee to his right side of the chest while playing football. Chest x-ray. Okay. Brilliant, chest x-ray pneumothorax. So uh, while you are seeing this patient, you find him, he is struggling to breathe. So he was having a significant shortness of breath. Vital signs, brilliant, thank you. So he got a systolic blood pressure of 90. Uh, yes, excellent, thank you. And, and he got a pulse of 125. Saturation was, saturation was 80% on uh, room air. Yes, so he got a, yes, I can see one of the answers is a tension pneumothorax, is his chest x-ray. It is a right-sided tension pneumothorax. So as you mentioned, as you mentioned, guys, uh, uh, unstable patient, both him and are suspect, and then go, go for an ABCDE approach. So his ABCD approach, his airway, yes, excellent. So airway is patent, need of decompression. I can see need of decompression immediately, thank you. Breathing, so while you're checking breathing, you can check the neck, so need decompression, then chest tube, thank you. So how to check the neck, what you will find in the neck with the tension pneumothorax? Yes, thank you. So the has GVB will be raised, tracheal deviation to the other side, thank you so much. Yes, so distended GVB and tracheal deviation, then going to the chest, by inspection, you find the decrease movement on the right-hand side, hyper resonant percussion, decrease air entry, and normal heart sounds. Yes, he's a bit hypotensive, cystic of 90. Yes, thank you. So once you got this diagnosis, uh, ideally, so tension pneumothorax is a clinical diagnosis. You shouldn't be waiting for a chest X-ray. Uh, so I can see in the answer, someone mentioned an, uh, a needle decompression. So you have to do a needle decompression immediately. So you have to explain to the patient what's going on there make sure it's complete uh, aseptic technique and needle decompression where we are going to put the needle. So second intercostal space. So this patient got a right side tension pneumothorax. So we are putting in the second right intercostal space, microvicular line just above the rib. Uh, make sure you are not, you are doing a complete aseptic technique and you're giving some local anesthetic as well. Okay, and following the, the decompression, what we are going to do, so no, we shouldn't do a chest X-ray. We should decompress the chest. Uh, regarding this question, should we do a chest X-ray if we suspect a tension pneumothorax? No, it's ideally, it's a clinical diagnosis. It's a life-threatening clinical diagnosis. You, we shouldn't be waiting for a chest X-ray. If we, if we got uh, uh, this diagnosis in your mind and this patient clinically got tension pneumothorax, then you have to decompress the chest without waiting for a chest X-ray, yes. So chest drain, so where we are going to put? Brilliant, thanks so much. Yes, so we're doing in a safe triangle in the right-hand side, and then this patient to be admitted under cardiothoracic team. Thanks so much. So the next step, the next patient is this guy, 75 years old lady uh, who coming to the ED with 
uh, central chest pain rotating to her back and this pain started 10 hours ago. What you're going to do for her? A, B, C, D approach, brilliant, thank you. History and physical examination, yes. So in the history, more history, brilliant, thank you. So this pain is center of the chest going to the center of the back. It's a tearing in nature. Uh, uh, and this pain, what, when it started, it was 10 out of 10 and was associated with her, her left-sided weakness to her body. So yes, I can see the answer with aortic dissection. Yes, so how to diagnose aortic dissection? CT, CT aortogram, yes. So that the investigation of choice is a CT, hour, CT aortogram, yes. So yes, as we mentioned at the, at the start of this lecture, uh, mainly history and medical examination. Yes, X-ray finding, first density, brilliant. Thanks so much, yes, this is ideal, yes. So history, history and physical examination in most of the chest pain patient coming to the ED, along with doing a chest X-ray, ECG plus minus chest X-ray will give you a clear hint or a clear diagnosis about what's going on there. Yes, so this patient got an aortic dissection with a CT, CT aortogram. Uh, she's known to have high blood pressure, which is high likely for such patient to present with uh, this picture. Uh, uh, consider, consider aortic dissection with any schist pain presentation with weird neurological symptoms, you know, like schist pain with picture of stroke. Sometimes schist pain with uh, abdominal pain, you know, like some patient dissection could be involved in a celiac celiac axis causing for the mesenteric ischemia coming with a abdomen as well. So yeah, yeah, reaching this diagnosis, what you're going to do next for her? That's, yes, we need to control her, but yeah, that, that was her chest X-ray. So in the chest X-ray, we can find that uh, she got some few changes there, which is a wide mediastinum and loss of contour of aortic knuckle. Okay, so yeah, as you, as you know, that X-ray is not diagnostic for, for aortic dissection. Even the ECG, uh, you should have a high index of suspicion to uh, to to be to diagnose uh, an aortic dissection. And the aortic dissection presentation to the ED is a, one of the easily missed uh, presentation to the ED. Yes, so we have to control her blood pressure. This lady, her blood pressure systolic was around 190. So yes, so we need a resus bed for this patient. We need to control the pain because she's coming with a tearing central back pain, and she got high blood pressure, so we need to control this blood pressure as well. And then stabilize blood pressure, less than 120, okay. And we need to contact a cardiothoracic team early, okay. Uh, and the next question is pain, blood pressure called cardiologist. Okay, so card, no, it's, we, we need card, cardiac surgeon, so we need a cardiothoracic surgeon. Cardiology is for medical cardiac problem. Cardiac surgeon is for surgical cardiac problem. Thank you. Yes, uh, and surgery of supplies, don't communicate. Okay, so what are types and what are the types of aortic dissection? How many types we have? So yeah, so this is Stanford classification, type A and type B. So type A is ascending plus minus descending aorta and type B is descending aorta. Type A is usually will need a surgical treatment and type B usually will need a medical treatment. Brilliant, thanks so much. So next, the last one is a 45 years old male. He was drinking alcohol last night, had many times of vomiting, woke up in the middle of the night with severe onset chest pain. Yes, it is right, it is Borhaf syndrome. Brilliant, thank you. Brilliant, yes, yeah. so what happened for this patient is because of uh, persistent vomiting, he got a tear or perforation to his esophagus causing for him uh, uh, this pain going to his chest. Yes, excellent. So this is esophageal rupture. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so uh, yes, this is his chest X-ray. Yes, he's alcoholic. Yes, he is. That is his chest X-ray. Can you see anything on the chest X-ray? Yes. So you can see a uh, pneumomediastinum here. Yes, you can see these. Or there's subclinical emphysema here, and there's some blackish lines here, which is air and subclinical emphysema. Brilliant, yes, chest X-ray. And you can see here in this X-ray, there's some subclinical emphysema here as well. Okay, and there's some here and here, some plaque line here, which means 
he got a pneumo mediastinum and that diagnosis was boyer half syndrome, as you mentioned. So what will be the next step? Are you going to send him home or, or are you going to keep him in a hospital? So yeah, so, uh, so this patient will need to be admitted to the hospital. Uh, Yes, so he will need you know, he he will need IV antibiotics while he is in in your department in the emergency department. So he will need to be covered with a metronidazole and comoxiclab, PPI. Yes, so he will need an esophagogram or or an endoscopy to to check where is the tear and to be treated. So in in some hospital, this patient will be admitted under medical team for IV antibiotics. In other facilities, he will be admitted under cardiothoracic team. Uh, for you know the IV antibiotics and uh, scope and and other management plan, brilliant. Yes, endoscopy if, stab if stabilized for or for management, brilliant. Yes, but so the the key point here, he he will need to be kept in the hospital. And so, so yeah, so the investigation of of choice is 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 esophagogram. He will need the endoscopy at some point, but the the investigation of choice is esophagogram. Depends on the facility and depends on how bad is the patient, how how bad he looks like. Brilliant, thank you. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so at the end now, so if you know there are many types of chest pain, as we mentioned early, you can find it in a young patient in a pediatric coming to you with a chest pain. You will find it in a teenagers and and middle aged and and elderly population coming to you with a chest pain. The key point is taking a good history and doing a good physical examination, plus ECG in some of the cases, plus minus chest X-ray in some cases as well. And, and some blood tests in a few of those patients will give you a firm diagnosis to be made or a confidentiary assurance to send your patient home. So chest pain could be either cardiac or could be non-cardiac. So the cardiac reason for a chest pain could be ischemic or non-ischemic, ischemic like angina, stable angina, unstable angina, and a myocardial infarction, and non-ischemic pericarditis and myocarditis. And non-cardiac causes of a chest pain could be gastrointestinal, like a reflux, esophageal spasm, and a bipt sorry, biptic ulcer disease. And, and non-GIT non will be aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, and pneumonia, and pneumothorax, and musculoskeletal. Uh, going to the next slide, which is, is there any questions? Indicator for a massive BE. All right, that's a, that's a really good question. So indicator for a massive BE. So uh, if, if the patient coming with a chest pain and, and uh, a, a polaritic sound chest pain with a high Wilson score, you know, like, our patient here had a history of DVT before and she stopped her, her anticoagulant and she's coming with a one day history of a polaritic chest pain and that some ECG was a sinus tachy. And, and then is there any bedside thing you can do to check? So you have a high suspicion in your mind that this patient most likely got a BE and, and she's unstable. For example, she is hypotensive and tachycardic as well and she requiring oxygen. For example, her oxygen saturation was 80%. Uh, is there anything specific you can do as a bedside to check, to confirm your diagnosis? So you, you, now in your mind, you have a high likely this lady got a BE, a pulmonary embolism. Is, is there anything you can do bedside to check, to confirm your diagnosis? Okay, so you can do an ultrasound, a bedside ultrasound echo to her heart. And what echo, brilliant, thank you, thanks. So we can do an echo for her heart. And what we are checking the echo, what the, what the echo finding for the BE, the massive BE, sorry, massive BE. Yes, that's absolutely right. So you will find, uh, so usually there are three criteria. Okay, bruxismal septal, okay. All right, so the three criteria in an echo, uh, Okay, regurg okay, okay, so all right. So the first thing is you can see the thrombus in the right side of the heart. You can see it clearly in the echo. The second, the second one is a right ventricle size to the left ventricle size will be one to one. Ideally, it should be less than one, right to left. Okay, so that so the first one is thrombus in the in the right side of the heart. You can see it with an ultrasound with an echo. The second one is right ventricle size to left ventricle size is one-to-one. -one. And the third one is distended IVC, inferior vena cava. 
if you got one of these uh, features on a bedside echo, then you have a firm diagnosis that you got a massive BE and this lady is unstable. And, and, and giving thrombolysis uh, uh, for such patients. So because this patient will be a bit tricky because she's unstable and it's a bit difficult to send her to the CT while she is unstable. So it will need a senior decision to give thrombolysis. Usually it will be a combined senior ED doctor, like a consultant or a senior registrar on the shop floor with uh, a senior ITO uh, registrar as well, or a senior ITO consultant to give thrombolytic for such patient. So the IVC is an inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava. So you can see it on the ultrasound. If it is distended, this means a right ventricular strain or a, this is a sign of, of a BE. Brilliant, brilliant. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, uh, so uh, my pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. First of all, the same cases with a clinical finding in shit X-ray source for same, sorry, for same these cases with a clinical finding in a shit X-ray ECG. Uh, I, I can't understand this question. Source for same these cases, the clinical finding on the ECG. So the sources for the shit pain, I, I uploaded from uh, Oxford uh, textbook for emergency medicine. Uh, I hope this answers your question. Uh, again, thanks so much. Uh, my pleasure to be here with you guys and all the best.